Funding for the production of Folks is made possible in part by a grant from Union National Life Insurance, serving Louisiana and the South since 1926, a family-managed corporation providing whole life insurance. Straight ahead on Folks, what are black Greek organizations, and why are they such a large part of college life for many black students? A look at black sororities and fraternities on today's edition of Folks. Hello everyone and welcome to Folks. I'm Sonia Massengale. World famous writer, actress and singer Maya Angelou was in Baton Rouge recently and during her address she spoke of how Black History Month has gone from Black History Day to Black History Week to Black History Month in a few years. Now since Martin Luther King's birthday has been made into a national holiday, Black History Month begins somewhere in the middle of January and continues into the month of February. She said that she looks forward to a time when black history becomes integrated into American history and there is no need for a special day, week, or month. Today's program is about people who play an important role in black American history every day of their lives, those who belong to black Greek letter organizations. Most fraternities and sororities were founded for lofty ideals of brotherhood, sisterhood, academic excellence, community service, and as a social outlet for people who had in common a desire to educate and uplift other black people. Most were founded during the early years of this 20th century, some at predominantly white universities and some at historically black universities. Wherever they were founded, they quickly became powerful and often elite organizations for those involved. But contrary to their white counterparts, black fraternal organizations became much more than a social set to belong to during the college years. After graduation, their numbers often increase, and the graduate chapters of these organizations have become politically and socially empowered so as to actually make a difference in black communities across America. Of course, each club considers themselves unique, and they are in different ways, and a lot of good-natured kidding goes on between the clubs over the merits of one over the other, but they all have in common a very real commitment to achievement. We visited Dillard University in New Orleans to talk to the young members of several black Greek letter organizations. The beautiful houses on Sorority Row on the LSU campus in Baton Rouge symbolize much of what encompasses fraternal life for white students in Greek letter clubs. A comfortable place to live, a social outlet, a chance to do some good works for the community. Black Greek letter organizations don't provide housing for their members, but they do provide a sense of brotherhood that lasts beyond the college experience. Here at Dillard University in New Orleans, a very large part of campus life centers around the Greek letter organizations. There is the social outlet, of course, but more importantly, an emphasis on helping the community at large. Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated was founded in 1913 on the campus of Howard University in Washington, D.C. They are known primarily as a social service sorority. Most of the, um, the, most of the most important people in my life, most influential people in my life were Deltas. And I had a lot of experiences with them doing watching them do public service or different things in the communities or um, pro doing things for the children, for older people, and just they had a lot of fun. They looked like they were just a, a group of sisters. Just sisters always having a lot of fun. And they were always doing things to help other people. I guess for me it, it began a long time ago. I grew up around women who were Deltas, strong women. Uh, I am a legacy. My mother, all of my aunts are members of Delta Sigma Theta. And I grew up helping them participate in different functions, public service projects that were going on in my hometown of St. Louis. And, <clears throat> excuse me, when I came to college, I really, there was nothing else for me to consider. And I knew that even if things weren't exactly the way I wanted them to be here at Beta Gamma Chapter, that from what I'd seen growing up, I was going to do my best to make sure that things were exactly the way I saw them when I grew up. But when I did get here, the women here of Delta were really on the move. 
they were doing what they were supposed to do and having, as Teresa said, a whole lot of fun, a whole lot of fun. And that was exactly what I wanted to be a part of, people out there helping in the community and having fun. And that's why I chose Delta. Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity was founded in 1911 at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. These members of the fraternity says that achievement makes their fraternity special. Kappa Alpha Psi's main goal is achievement. And I feel that every young man should try to achieve as much in any field of endeavor that he chooses. And I figured that Kappa Alpha Psi best um, fits that goal in my life. But I'm from Indiana, I'm from Indianapolis, and Kappa Alpha Psi was founded in Bloomington, which is about 50 miles from my hometown, so I grew up with a lot of Kappas around me, and that played a you know, big part in that. Alpha Phi Alpha has the distinction of being the first black Greek letter organization founded on the predominantly white campus of Cornell University in New York in 1906. I chose Alpha Alpha because uh, the fraternity showed a, a, a sort of prominence among our race. Plus, um, in, as my college career was starting, I felt that um, this fraternity gave um, a sort of admiration as far as um, black college men is concerned to achieve scholarship, um, academic excellence, and plus a social atmosphere with um, fellow college mates. I think it was sort of predestined for me since my father is now for also, but uh, apart from that, I've been on a number of college campuses before, and everywhere I go, it seemed to get the same impression of the fraternity. The service, the uh, unity, the uplifting of the black race and things of that sort. I think that sort of uh, geared me toward Alpha Phi Alpha. And it's basically a, just an image thing also. Just the way they presented themselves before I pledged kind of gave me the inkling to go in and pledge that. Zeta Phi Beta Sorority was founded in 1920 as sister organization to Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity, which was founded at Howard University in 1914. They say their organizations both allow for the uniqueness of the individuals. I chose Zeta Phi Beta Sorority after looking at all the sororities, and I felt that with, through Zeta, I could better myself and get involved in community services. And also with Zeta, I could be myself. I didn't have to be known for being a certain type of person. I felt that I had goals in common with the organization, and they stand for service, scholarship, final womanhood, and sisterly love. And through them, I felt I could be in a family atmosphere. When I pledged Sigma, I chose it because, well, when viewing uh, all four organizations, I wanted to find one whereas I can be myself as opposed to um, fitting into an image or being a carbon copy of someone else. Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority was founded at Howard University in Washington, D.C. in 1908. They are a social and social service sorority. First of all, let me state that I was the first in my family to attend a major college, and I didn't really know about black Greek organizations. And when I came to Dillard, the Alpha Kappa Alphas were distinguished women, and I liked the way they presented themselves around the society and the community service that they presented, and I felt that that was the right sorority for me. I chose Alpha Kappa Alpha because I was, I knew about Greek organizations before I came to Dillard, and Alpha Kappa Alpha was the one that really appealed to me. I saw that above all others, other uh, Greek organizations, and that's why I chose it. What you see here is a part of a Greek show at Dillard University. This is the occasion where all of the sororities and fraternities show off their colors and intricately performed steps to emphasize the virtues of their own clubs and some friendly put-downs of their rival organizations are thrown in for fun. This usually takes place after new members are inducted. But just how serious is the rivalry between different groups? I take it seriously as far as, like, I don't like anyone to try to um, handle my sorority in a negative way or say bad things about it, but I don't, I don't believe in violence or anything like that. I'm, it's, it's not that serious. I mean, I'm a big enough person to walk away from silly things like that, but I don't appreciate it from anyone because my sorority is very special. Good things have also come out of the rivalry. If uh, the Deltas are participating in, or in a function at Dillard's campus, then that also 
helps say the AKAs or the Zetas to want to become involved so they because they don't want to be left out and the same way with the men and that way it's positive because you get all of the organizations participating because they don't want to be the ones that were left out I believe Delta is outstanding because we are nationally known as a public service organization we do participate in social functions but above all our number one function is public service to do all that we can in the community and that's why I think Delta stands out above the rest I take the rivalries very seriously it helps you know band together with your brothers and make you closer than normal closer than you'll ever be like outside the family and you know you have that caring for one another and looking out for your brother when you say rivalry I don't feel as though there's a rivalry. It's more so a presence in predominantly black institutions as opposed to white institutions. Greek as a, Greeks as a whole, I think they're more so banding together. I mean, there's a, there's a, different, a difference in between Greeks and non-Greeks. And just like if you're at a white institution, white Greeks and black Greeks, there's always that difference. Now, when you say rivalry, I'm sure there is a, a modest rivalry in the sense that we're all trying, to, we're all throwing parties, we're all trying to achieve in the community, but that's not something that we, there's an animosity. I don't think there's an underlying animosity there at all because that's nothing that I feel and my affiliations with the other members of the Greek fraternities and sororities, I don't think there's an animosity. You know, if there is, I don't think it's enough that it should be harped upon as a negative sense. I think the, the greatest value um, is the association that you make with other people. Um, there are not many activities on Dillard's campus per se where you know people can get together in um, small groups and are banded for a common purpose and I think that's the biggest um, asset of joining a sorority. Linda Foy is one of the faculty advisors for Zeta Phi Beta and Linda Nash is the Panhellenic Council Advisor for all of the Greek letter organizations at Dillard. Both say that the organizations have more in common than they will admit and tend to work together as campus leaders. When we have all the organizations functioning to their fullest ability, uh, there is a friendly rivalry that goes along with it that adds to the flavor of campus life. What about the students who are not involved in Greek letter organizations? Do they feel left out of campus activities? There is a grade point requirement to pledge to begin with. And so we know that you know only certain people who have the grade point average will be able to pledge. Um, I would I would think that you know someone who is left out may have some hard feelings, but we hope too that it serves as an incentive that you know if you want to pledge and if you see an organization that you want to belong to, that you will work harder to to meet the qualifications for that group, and thereby you're not only making yourself qualified for the for the sorority, but you're also improving your whole academic standing and you're standing on campus because we do look for the leaders and you know that's what we want in the in the clubs. For many of our freshmen uh, this may be their first exposure to Greekdom and it does give them something to look forward to. They enjoy uh, activities that the Greeks are involved in on campus as much as those who are members of these organizations. For upperclassmen, uh, by the time they're sophomores, juniors, and seniors, of course, they have aligned themselves with their friends. And on this campus, uh, Greeks and non-Greeks exist, coexist, and, and appreciate one another. And, and that's the wonderful thing about it on this campus in particular, and I'm sure it's like that other places, but I don't think that there's a problem or, or a jealousy or envy going on with those who are non-Greek. There were two Greek letter organizations that were unavailable for interviews on the day that we taped our feature. They are Omega Psi Phi Fraternity, founded at Howard University about 75 years ago, and Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority. Joining us in the studio today to talk about Greek letter organizations and what happens after graduations are members of two of the largest internationally renowned sororities in the country. They are Doville Essex. She is the past basilisk of Gamma Eta Omega Chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated and Carol Adams, president of the Baton Rouge Sigma Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Welcome to folks. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I want to get personal. <laughs> when, I, when I pledged Delta, I had no choice. My mother, I was a double legacy, 
And it was something that I just knew I would always be. And supposedly, when I was born, my mother turned to my sister and said, now I have two little deltas. So you can see I've been indoctrinated from birth to, to go that way. And I did pledge graduate chapter not in college. I'm curious. Why did you choose Alpha Kappa Alpha, and why did you choose Delta Sigma Theta? I'd like to start with you, Ms. Essex. Well, when I attended college, Gremlin State University, there were no Greek letter organizations. I had graduated from college when the undergraduate chapter became a part of, of Grambling. I had, however, had contact with many women of various uh, Greek letter organizations. And I had decided that whenever the opportunity became available, uh, it would be Alpha Kappa Alpha. Alpha Kappa Alpha was not the first um, graduate chapter to come. I was still living at Grambling. It was not the first Greek letter or graduate chapter to come to uh, Grambling. And I was asked if I were going to join the other. And I said, well, no, I'll wait. So I had chosen Alpha Kappa Alpha. There was no one else in my family. I didn't have your problem. <laughs> it was a matter of deciding that these uh, women had something that I was interested in. Which was? Which was service and scholarship. And I, I'm not saying that that is the, um, is the key only to Alpha Kappa Alpha, because if we really look at sororities and fraternities, our basic purpose and philosophy is the same. And I think it's a matter of looking at the fine differences in making your choices. Alpha Kappa Alpha was established at Howard, we know, in 1908, the yes. first of the Greek letter organizations. Yes. And at the beginning, emphasis was on scholarship and service. And as we move on through these 80 years, we're celebrating 80 years this year, it is still emphasis on scholarship and service, but rather than at the local level, we are concerned with it nationally and internationally. All right, Ms. Adams, your turn. <laughs> Why did you choose Delta Sigma Theta? Well, growing up in the Baton Rouge community, I was a part of an organization that we used to call the Dell Sprites, and it was working with the young people in this organization that first uh, led me to think about Delta Sigma Theta. And then, of course, when I attended Southern University, I had my mind and my heart set on, at that point, becoming a Delta. And uh, next year, I will celebrate 25 years in this organization, of which I am very, very pleased. Uh, and just like uh, Mrs. Essex has already said, the goals and the objectives, the purposes of the organizations have already been set forth. And they are basically the same, that is, of scholarship, of high moral character of excellence and character and of trying to pursue those things in life that are worthwhile. So the Deltas to me just stood out and I'm very proud that I um, did go that way as they say. It, it, was it a major decision for you? Well at the point that I decided to become a Delta it was not a major decision because my mind was totally made up. I didn't have to think about any other way because I had never really considered any other way. We, we keep saying that the goals and, and the determination and the reasons why we were all founded are similar. I think someone said when I pledged Delta that your sorority sister is your sister, but the other sororities are like your cousins. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that that was yeah. put probably the best it could be. Now we know that there are some sisters, blood sisters, who belong to different sororities. Mm -hmm. well, I'm think, I can think of two sisters who are very close friends of mine. Earlene Carey Williams, who is an Alpha Kappa Alpha woman, mm -hmm. and her sister Thelma Tacno is Delta. Mm -hmm. But we all consider each other very close. They're, when there's something that uh, Delta needs done, if we can help, we help. If there's something that Alpha Kappa Alpha needs done and Delta can help, Delta can help. Delta will help. And this is true. We don't have uh, Zeta Phi Theta represented here today, mm -hmm. but this is, is very true of of, them of all also. sororities and fraternities. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so much for the rivalry between the, the organizations. It's just too much fun to pass up. What happens to an Alpha Kappa Alpha and a Delta Sigma Theta once they graduate from college? Who'd like to start? For you, Ms. Essex. Well, once, what happens uh, to uh, Alpha Kappa Alpha uh, undergraduate, once she becomes a, a graduate soror, 
before she leaves the, the, the uh, college, her graduate advisor has made available to the, to the graduate chapters those sorors who are graduating. And we make an attempt to get those sorors interested uh, in joining the graduate chapter. We encourage them to join the graduate chapters in whatever city uh, they find themselves. On just uh, Monday night, we had our regular monthly meeting. And uh, among the sorors, new faces there were a number of undergraduates. And th there were three of them who had been on the same line, as you know, un undergraduates talk about line sisters. And they were so thrilled that here we are. Some of them had been away in graduate school at other places, but now they were back home and they were joining um, our particular chapter. We have two chapters, however, in the, just as Delta has, two uh, graduate chapters in the area and two undergraduate chapters here, one in Hammond. Graduate sorors in the chapters sponsor those undergraduate uh, sorors. So we have a lot of contact. And with us, we have uh, two meetings per year with the undergraduates, so they get an opportunity to see what it's like. Graduate chapters mm -hmm. in action. That's uh, right. It's said that really the fraternity and sorority activities pick up after graduation. The graduate chapters are less involved, it seems, with social activities and much more involved with actual community service. Would you agree yes, with that? Many times when uh, the young ladies are in the gra uh, undergraduate chapters, they are involved in working in school and trying to graduate and trying to pursue a career. Many times when you join the graduate chapter, uh, we find that we are more settled in our communities and then ready to take on the responsibility of our public service at a more, um, at a scale that's a lot higher than probably was in undergraduate uh, school. We have a program that we use when undergrad uh, SOAS come to our chapter. We have um, a way of trying to get them involved in chapter activities right away so that they are they feel like they belong and they don't feel like they have to stay apart from the graduate chapters along the same lines as aka we have uh, graduate sorors who work on the campuses who sponsor the young ladies and help them in the change from graduate from undergraduate to the graduate chapter so we try to keep them involved and, and get them into the working of the sorority as soon as possible and when you start working and become committed and dedicated, then it's hard to stop. We have a saying about that. Yes. <laughs> you know, says, I'm yes. sure the AKAs yes. do too. Um, tell me, what kind of activities are going on on a national level with Delta Sigma Theta sorority? In Delta Sigma Theta, we sponsor a five-point program thrust. And in each one of our five points, we have chapters all over the country and all over the nation, as, as you've already said, that work under this five-point program. One of our five points is called educational development, another one physical and mental health, and the third one economic development, the fourth one international community and international involvement, and the fifth one political awareness. So in each one of these five thrusts, we are able to work our chapter projects around this total program. Here in Baton Rouge, we sponsor in our own chapter, Baton Rouge Sigma, we sponsor a testing workshop, which is uh, under our umbrella of educational development. And what happens is this, we invite many of the high school students to come. They spend a day with us in workshops. We invite local p people to work with them, teaching them some test-taking skills and things that they need to know, especially about the ACT. Um, we also sponsor the Doug Williams Football Clinic, which, as you know, will probably a sponsor again. We're going to have it on April 30th this year. And this is a part of our physical and mental health thrust that we uh, invite many young people into the, in, from the community to come. And we have the professional football players there led by, of course, Doug Williams. And they give the uh, young people insight and tips and skills on, on football. But it's a part of our mental and physical health thrust. So we can work, we're constantly working under this umbrella to carry out our chapter programs. Mrs. Essex, what's going on with Alpha Kappa Alpha nationally and on a local level? Well, nationally and locally. As we indicated, we are largely concerned with a scholarship, with leadership, with youth, with the black family, and economic development. Uh, we, each year, as a part of the national thrust, uh, plan a tutorial program, enrichment and tutorial program for 
children from uh, first grade through sixth grade. Uh, this is a two-week program. Last year, we uh, had in attendance over 200 uh, children. The SOROS work uh, in the uh, teaching of these children in classes and evaluation and, and whatnot. One last question. Once you, must you be a college graduate in order to belong to one of these sororities? You must be uh, a college graduate uh, to be a member of the uh, graduate uh, chapters in Alpha Kappa Alpha. Um, undergraduates may, if they meet certain scholarship and uh, character and other, meet the other requirements, they may be initiated into undergraduate chapters. But if they do not graduate, then they may be associate members until certain other requirements are, are met. I see. But members of the graduate or the alumni chapters are uh, college graduated women. Is it the yes, same? Yes, one of the Delta? qualifications of our uh, sorority is that you must be a college graduate. And just as Mrs. Essex has said, we do stress scholarship, and so that is very important. I believe uh, that all of the Greek letter organizations, the black uh, organizations that we have talked about today, will probably have that same qualification. Uh, we are interested in those persons who are pursuing degrees, and that's the reason that many of them do pledge in undergraduate school. I really enjoyed having you, and we we'll hope to see you again someday on folks as you continue with your community service activities. Let us know. We surely will. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. We enjoy being here. Now, time for a folks update. A few months ago, we introduced Evelyn Fields Updike, writer, movie producer, and minister of Shreveport, Louisiana, and her screenplay adaptation entitled Tambia Bori. I wanted to do something different, something that kind of uh, captured the beautiful, spiritual, psycho, religious elements of the South and projected it in a positive light. It kind of explored uh, our cultural plurality, while at the same time lifting African Americans in the South above those uh, stereotypical images, and uh, Tommy Burry provided me with that. Um, it's a theme of, about an old house and, of course, a family, a very wealthy family of blacks who, uh, who have a history of involvement in, uh, in the supernatural. So it, it provided me with that, uh, with that atmosphere that I needed. We're pleased to announce Evelyn Updike's most recent achievement, the publication of Tommy Burry, the novel. Thanks for joining us, and be sure to tune in next week for an in-depth look at the gifted and talented program in our schools. See you then. Bye-bye. Funding for the production of Folks is made possible in part by a grant from Union National Life Insurance, serving Louisiana and the South since 1926, a family-managed corporation providing whole life insurance.